Thank you very much. Welcome everyone and welcome to those that couldn't be here. What we're going to go through today is we're going to talk about the structure of the event and some of the issues in terms of managing the event which are important to us and therefore important to all the schools. We're going to talk about the draw and how a draw operates. We're going to talk about sportsmanship, coaches and teachers, weights, Big 15, which is selection for the nationals. We're going to talk a bit about umpires too and we're going to talk about umpire consistency which varies from event to event, and it varies according to the closeness of the situation and how that's a competitive risk that the competitors need to manage. And then finally, our, uh, our damage scenario and how we're going to do our best to manage that. So, one of the lessons we learned from last year is that people really need to read the SIs. We'll be publishing the SIs uh, once we get the final numbers. Um, and the SIs will contain the format of the competition, including the draw. Basically, if we're having a look at the first, I'll just put this up here. We're going to start off with um, two split round robins. So we're going to seed them based on the John Middleton series to give us two round robins of 36 and 28 races. So if we get that done, we've got a set of results. Then, We'll complete that and then we'll continue on. Our aim is to do a full round robin. We want to get that done for the first on the Friday, get that all done in the day. From there, we're going to split into gold and silver fleets. Our first goal is to do a round robin in each of those. Round robins are the best way of fairly deciding things. So, so just to clarify that one, Ben, <coughs> this top part will be the, the, the Friday racing and this second part that we're seeing here will be what occurs on the Saturday don't you? Yeah, if we get time up our sleeve, yeah. we'll actually go into this. So when you yeah. knock some of this off, it's all going to be weather dependent. Um, how many nice and races are going to be on the Saturday at say 10 o'clock? Uh, I believe it'll just be just be building to uh, about 10. It'll be a bit lighter in the morning and then it'll be strengthening as the day goes on. Okay. It'll and be perfect. Terrific. And how, how, many, um, how many hours have we lost due to breakouts? At that stage, oh, no, so no, all, the boat, all, the, all the boats are in perfect condition and uh, uh, don't have a, don't, haven't had a single problem. Okay. So the only thing that would be holding us up would be uh, we've got to stop the hearings. Yeah, but and there won't be any of those. No disputes. Okay. So, so the challenge for us is that we're planning now an event and we're going to have uncertain variables. If you remember last year, um, the, on Friday night, we thought we'd be lucky to get some racing in, maybe five or six races. And it actually died at 9.30 in the morning, and lots of people held the view that it could probably, probably be, that's it, that's the end of the series. So what event organisers do is we do all the possible races that would be possible, every single combination. So we've got these for our finals. But as the weather causes us issues, or any other competition issues, we will actually terminate parts of these. So it could be that we say, we're just not going to be able to do gold and silver round robbers. So based on gold and silver results, we might go to knockouts. Or if it's absolutely terrible conditions, we might go to finals. And the finals, the intention is to be um, first to three wins. But if we get pressed for time, then we'll terminate part of that and we'll take it back to first to two wins. So it's going to be the race committee deciding based on the available time, expected conditions, what the format is, the race committee will decide which of these we should terminate. And, and to give you an idea, to do the full round robin that we, we hopefully have done on the Friday, there's about um, 80 or 90 races, I don't think I've got up the exact number in my, off of my head. But, so, that gives you the idea of with 14 first teams, that sort of gives you the idea that we're on pressure we're under, which is on the perfect day, it's just like uh, it is right now at the side, it's a beautiful 12 knot breeze. We, we probably have no problem getting to that number. Um, four fleets of boats for those 14 teams, so the, the seconds will be on the Thursday, but for those who haven't realised that the seconds are on the Thursday, and hopefully all the seconds realise they're on the Thursday. Uh, um, and so that'll, that'll give us a really good opportunity to get everyone out on the water, and to, to get through a good bunch of racing. So um, ho hopefully we're in a good position on the, on the Saturday and just it can be really about finals and finalising results and having a go. Uh, yeah, big lift. Chris and Boyce, so that would mean then that uh, every race in the round robin on the 
Friday for the first and Sydney on Thursday for the second is actually a finals because of how you could end up with no wind and therefore the winner or the top place team out of the round robins actually ends up winning the state championships. Correct. The, the potential is is that if we then get hit by bad weather, and we're going to race up to the maximum that we can in all the forecasts, but um, let's say we get blown out, it could be that these first six races were the most important races of the whole series. It can go backwards. So every race is really going to count for everyone. Um, cool. The other challenge that we're going to have is with the seconds. So at the moment we've got 17, 18 teams in the seconds. Um, that, if, to do a full round robin for that would be 136 races, which we can't do in a day. The best we've ever done with two race fees. Uh, two courses and uh, two complete sets of umpires and here's 120 uh, and we're not staffed up for that and we have perfect conditions so we won't be able to do that. So the seconds we'll be doing a similar sort of format but I think that we might also have um, a bronze in there as a format. This will all be published in the SIs once we know the final numbers. Gavin, how many more teams are we waiting on to get actual entries? We're probably waiting on between three and five teams. Yeah, and that'll make it. That, that's going to make a significant difference to the draw for us. So the draw will be in the SIs. So everyone needs to read it. In terms of if you get to this stage down here and you don't like the draw that was published in the SIs, you can um, request a hearing. It will go to the jury. The jury is most likely going to say. You knew about this two days ago. You haven't brought it up until now. The time limit for requesting redress has expired and it's an invalid request for redress. That's 95% or 100% certain? You think they're going to say that? I'd, I'd, I'd hate to say 100% certain, but I'd say it's 95% certain. If you, if you think you've got a potential problem with the draw or you think you've been unfairly placed in it or you the draws aren't balanced, any of those sort of things, bring it up as soon as possible because once the event started and we've started rolling, it's very hard to unwind races and say, oh, okay, but to make it fair. Like, if you think that we're going to get through the full round robin and so therefore it doesn't matter that I'm in the, the much harder draw, or you think that someone's stuffed up the, the seeding pattern and, you know, based on the results, you're, you're in the, you're for some reason, you know, you ended up with, with all the, the teams that have been winning the John Middleton trophy and so say, well, wait a minute, there's something wrong. Don't say it at the end of the, the the event when you think you've been unfairly hampered. Say it right at the beginning, and we're going to do something about it. But right at the end, you, you, it's going to be a question of, well, what else can we do? So, so we actually had a request for redress on that same scenario. You about to draw in the morning. After his first race, this is in on the weekend, after his first race, said, oh, you should have done this. It was a 30-second period. Uh, that was it. It was too hard. Just speaking on that, in regards to how seating works, what we'll do is from the John Middleton series, we'll get um, a seating list, which will probably give us something like, you know, probably down to ninth and tenth seats. It'll give us an accurate picture of that. We'll allocate them for the split round robin into blue and yellow on this format. This is how it's done for all the ISAT events. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, etc. These ones here, Luke will probably be making a, the best decision that he can in regards to which ones they can go into. But in terms of the scheme of things for the top markers, down to here, if he gets that wrong, if he gets 12 and 11 in the wrong order, it's not really going to have much of a impact or it, or it shouldn't. And I mean, those people we should have seen at the Grand Prix regatta, so hopefully all those, every team should have been seen at some point, so we should have a fairly balanced yeah. seating. It might just be a matter of how much weight gets put on the Grand Prix result versus how much weight gets put on how you've done the John Middle and things like that. If you don't like the seating, if Luke's followed this process, if the race committee has followed this process for seating, then yeah, you can't get redress. Uh, if they follow the process that they should be doing. 
you can't turn around and say I've got a different opinion or they didn't turn up to this when the, the results from the John Middleton are not representative. Um, the CEDA will do that and it's only if the CEDA has made an improper action that it's redressable. Once again, that would need to happen really early. Okay. Um, I've just got one other thing that will happen with the draw is, um, and unfortunately last year this, this meant that the, the girls' teams actually ended up waiting quite a while before they got out racing. Um, it won't happen this year because they'll start on Thursday, but the, um, the what's the trophy name? The Helen? No, no, the, what, what, the GSP. The, sorry, the, the GSP trophy. Um, we'll actually be um, we're looking to get that decided on the Thursday, and that those schools will have part of their initial round robin. They'll all race each other on the Thursday. Um, so um, there's a couple of things that, that you talked about how the, yeah. the, the girls that might want to go through into the into the first division works, but um, those girls teams um, their there'll be a round robin as part of their initial racing. They'll make sure that all the girls that the schools have raced each other. Uh, early on, so that we, we've got to resolve that trophy. Cool. So in that, we've got a number of divisions which are presenting a couple of challenges that we think that they're important that we try and get um, get them work through. So one of them will be the SSB trophy, and I think we might have six, somewhere between six and eight teams that are the eligible for that. Um, what we'll be looking at is um, top competitors from, and this is why we need to get the final entries in before we. Do this from the first, and we'll probably run the top from the seconds, and we'll have a knockout series for them to try and determine that trophy. So, if we've got them split across two different divisions, um, we're going to have uh, also uh, GPS, no, what is it? The APS, AGS, the AG. SB and APS and GSB and SSB. Yeah. So we're going to have all of those trophies up to grabs. We would love to get a couple more schools so that we can have an ACS. Um, that we, we've said there's a minimum of four required, but we would love to have those uh, other two schools from ACS. So we'll be doing, uh, our, our hope is that we'll get some knockouts uh, finals so that we, we have you know, a bit of intensity around those results and that'll be great to watch. Um, if not, if the weather fails us on the Saturday and we can't do those mixtures, then we'll be going back to these results. Um, so the overriding message in this is if you want to understand what's going on, you'll need to read the sailing instructions and be fully conversant. Bear in mind, it's a completely proper action of the race committee, and we expect them to do it, is to terminate and to knock out parts of these, change the format, so that we get the best results, set the results that we can. And, and we always aim to run it expecting a full breeze. So we go for as much that we're going to have a good breeze, and it's going to be a perfect day, and work backwards from there. We don't aim for it's going to be horrible, and then find out we've got a perfect breeze, and everyone gets wrapped up, and we're you know, it's 10 o'clock on Saturday and we've all gone home. Um, so we want to, you know, have some good racing, have a fair result, um, and uh, if the wind allows us. Good. Next one um, is sportsmanship. So we'll be enforcing the highlands of sportsmanship which are conducted within our event, but also um, as expected in all of the codes of conduct for all of the schools. So. In school competitions, it's expected there's a really high level of sportsmanship. Uh, the schools all reinforce that with their own policies, um, that uh, uh, an honest result is more important than a win. It's also in all of the different uh, codes from the school sporting associations, um, APS, SSB, SSB, etc. So we'll be doing that. We have in the past had um, some incidents where things have gone um, off the rails with the competitor. Uh, one of the things that we can do as judges, and it's yachting Australia policy, um, if there's a 69-ish type incident um, or a sportsmanship uh, issue, then we also have the option to consider giving it back to the school or another body where we are confident that it will be dealt with properly. 
So we may do that. Um, we did have in the past, uh, there was an issue with a student. Um, his teacher saw a grad student straight away. A student withdrew from the competition, um, apologised, and then went home. Um, in terms of that, that's perfectly acceptable under the YA guidance for misconduct. And um, we also feel that by having schools deal with things genuinely, we can get better results. Coaches and teachers. Um, so all the school uh, policies require that the coaches and teachers are, are familiar with all of the school's requirements. What that means for us is that um, the coaches and the teachers, the parents, the supporters, are not a part of the competition. Um, this is a school sailing competition. You don't have, um, at the head of the river, you don't have a coach getting involved in the competition, so we can keep it that way. But I want to distinguish that from coaches and teachers. James, you've got a duty of care for all of those. If something comes up and it's a concern about the welfare or the wellbeing, come and see us straight away. We, we distinguish that. Any help that we can get from you, um, as coaches and teachers, in supporting that, then we're going to jump straight on that. It doesn't give the opportunity to try and label something as being welfare when it's really just about the result of the same. Um, but we absolutely have got any issues dive in because we value that one first. Um, coaches and teachers, uh, so the teachers, not a drama, um, we'll go through this stuff, become teachers and you know everything that should be doing. All the coaches, we want them to either be registered coaches or that they have done the, um, they haven't done a coaches or instructors course and need to comply with the YA code of conduct for coaches and instructors. And we really have it as a strong expectation that they've at least done the Australian Sports Commission um, introductory or general coaching principles of the code. Yeah. So there's a course, and on our website, um, and we'll put this up uh, as a link, the website link is here. Okay. Anything on coaches and teachers? Cool. Obviously, coaches, the, the school is responsible for the behaviour of the parents and the supporters. And obviously, you don't want to be, sorry about that, Peter. <laughs> We're not going to be talking to the parents. Uh, there's a welfare, teachers in charge, and the teacher or the coach. Um, wait. Well, the problem is if we're, 
if, if they'd like to, well, I'm just saying if they'd like to, that's fine. If, if they have a preference for something in particular, that's fine. Um, but if we need 15 kilos for every boat in Division 1, we're going to be struggling to provide all of that. So, <coughs> yeah, if they can collect all of that, that'd be fantastic. We're just going to collect as much as we can as well. Um, so we'll have quite a lot here, I think, by the end of it. Um, we'll make sure that everyone's got enough. But if I have to pinch them, we'll pinch them here in the two thousand. Exactly. Thank you very much. How do you uh, guarantee that the weights are going on each each boat at the same time? Um, so the oh, okay. you know, it's, it's, it's self self uh, sort of control. It is, but there will be checks. So what does that say? Yeah, really so a lot of people know, you know, yeah. make, but make get the weight. Oh, oops, yeah. Yeah. Well, the idea is to have each team will, who needs weight will be marked in some way. So we're thinking about putting a, a little cable tie or something like that on life jackets, so we know that that particular team needs to carry weight, um, and then they can be checked by the changeover boat. Changeover boats will have a list of who needs what, so they can what, actually just cable tie with, with the tags say like yeah, kilo we could do that. Kilo Absolutely, we could do that. Like that. So yep. the person on the, on the boat knows yep. that they should carry it. So, sure. so but, sort of yep. like anything in sailing, it's a self policing sport. It is. Yeah. <laughs> but but we and we'll be doing random checks. So the idea of you know drinking up for the for the weighing, you know you, you might get weighed halfway through the competition on Saturday. Yep. So you know be honest about your weights. Um, I know in nationals past there's been um, you know. The, the drink issues. The, 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 mm. yeah, the, the, yeah. the weights will be random. So there is the potential of. So if we think things are going on, there'll be a chance to get the yeah. ball. Yeah. And yeah. it'll be. And it's, a lot, and a lot, it's a lot not the cable type. These yeah. are all here with your tags, like three, two, one. We know so what you need. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And we'll have a list out there, of course, with everybody. Um, so as I say, we'll be we'll checking those um, to make sure you're on the right level of weight here as well. So we another fun job for a chain over guys. Um, what I would say is that it's not really worth risking collecting for the national for a couple of years with one boat because the guys that won the team racing collection trials here a couple of weeks ago for the Worlds were 100 kilos in the team, two heavy. So they had 30 kilos plus in the boat, two more than some other teams, and they still won it by one after those out there. So that would be, be my sort of tip on that one. You know, a couple of kilos is probably not worth the bus. And just probably, the way that it's the university of you, if you're um Bulking up, if you're drinking so much water that you're throwing up afterwards. Mm -hmm. It makes the criteria for a full to deliver a bridge be a bridge in small ship. And it's probably a 69. Um, that's probably one where the jury would be inclined to take action themselves as opposed to just the leader. So this I forgot, I didn't know, or we've swapped crews and now this combination I just forgot that we needed to do more together. It is completely the onus of my competitors and um, we're not going to have any games with ship about weights. It's, uh, it's not going to happen. We're so there'll be a minimum of 150? 100, there have to be a minimum of 150 with 15 kilos of, of weight of that. It can be made up with And will they be tethered to the boats? Tethered to the boats. So, well, the plan with the, with the milk bottles is to be able to put some string through it so they're all tethered together. We lose them because of cap size. That's one of those things, I guess. We'll try and tie them into the boats where we can. I don't want to lose them either. We'll be paying for them for the place. So, it's a fun game, but uh, there we go. Uh, is there anything else I need to say? Oh, yes, of course. So, the girls' teams will be selected to stay on the division one. We'll talk about that in a minute. So, there will, be, there will be no requirement for anyone in Division 2, racing in Division 2, to carry weight. So, they can just race however they like. Give the girls' team will get to them. If anyone racing in Division 1 at any time during the regatta, I'll just say that for now, will be required to carry the correct weight and will be checked potentially. So keep an eye out for that. Um, obviously, we'll be weighing on the same set of scales, but um, you know, things do get over, you do sweat a little bit, so we'll get to lose up. Thank you. Big questions, quickly. Oh, yeah, go on. Um, Weights, you mentioned cable tie. Perhaps mm -hmm. the better solution would be to have a cable tie on any person under 50 kilos. That way we know if there's two cable ties on one boat, that they have to have, what do they can't say. How much they need. That's they they can't say on the other. Because they'll be under 50 kilos and therefore under 100 kbs. I, I, I think it's one of the more we'll, 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 yeah. we'll have a think about that. There were some nuances around, we don't, we don't want to publish a weight list for everyone as to what they weigh, if they're under or over this, it's sensitive. So, 
I understand the benefit in that. Um, it could be the changeover vote. It's got a list of everyone, and these are the different what traditionally happens. These these are all the crew combinations um, that they could have, and for this combination, they need to carry this vote. That could be the way. So it's, it's still just the finish off. But the general thing is 15 kilos. Um, is the maximum that you can do is make up correct weights and there's no funny business. Is there going to be a tolerance? So if it's a hot day and sometimes the kids you know, don't drink water, don't eat food, their their wetsuits sweating. Probably um, as opposed to kilos. having a hard tolerance, um, it is likely that there will be some minor discretion for the jury in terms of penalties. That's the most likely but that hasn't been completed but that's been considered. I mean, if, you're, if you're 115 and a half and weigh in and you come in at 114 and a half when you check again, you're going to probably be able to see that there is some discrepancy in the water intake potentially. If it's more major than I guess you know, I've dealt with that one. Yeah, so yeah. traditionally like for a 350 kilo team on a uh, Edgewater or Melbourne or something like that, they then allow 10 kilos tolerance and subsequent, subsequent weights. That's too much in the scale of things in the scar for a 10 kilo difference in a team. You know, it should, you know, kids that are starting off at 50, at 50 kilos, should be, you know, dropping 10%. So probably worth looking at an extra couple of kilos in yeah. One last question. If there's a Div 2 team having with two people under 50 kilos, and if by chance they qualify for Div 1 finals or whatever the scoring works, does that mean they'll be ineligible to stay on the finals? But they'll be so I don't think we've got that as a scenario. No, it's so only the girls' teams that have not The girls' that. teams, we're, we're looking at putting them up into the uh, Division 1 silver fleet, which means that they can get some really good racing. Um, we're still talking about that, looking at the draw, but obviously once you go into silver, you won't be able to qualify. So, so the answer is if you've got a second team, they, they won't have an opportunity to be in the third one goal team fight. Right. Yeah, you're talking about the requirements for uh, Big 15? No, you're not good at the moment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Big 15, what we've had in the past is uh, people have um, uh, achieved qualification but then taken it as an option. Um, and that's resulted in us missing out on being able to send some teams that really want to go to the nationals, to the nationals. We've also had them not being really serious about their, their training programs. Um, so we've set out a criteria, which is if you'd like to have the honour um, and the privilege of being selected for to represent Victoria and take it seriously, then we've defined all the things that you need to do to be able to represent Victoria. And that includes committing to a training program and also committing that you will be able to go and that your parents have said yes and your school is not mind you. So that's on the website. That's been out for a while, um, since before I went, I think. Yep. So that's been out for two weeks, I've been away. Um, so that's a requirement um, if you want to get selected for the national. Uh, we think that we've spelled it out really clearly. Once again, when we talk about time limits, uh, redress and improper action, and all of that sort of stuff, um, you know, the clock is ticking already. It has been for a couple of weeks. Um, what we don't want to have is a situation, uh, I know uh, a club that just ran a really major selection series and uh, Two of the teams that got uh, selected for a very high honour said, um, Oh, well, actually, uh, we don't really want to go, and uh, we just want to come and do the regatta. And that was pretty harsh on everyone, so we don't want wasted effort in terms of what we're doing. Have you got anything you'd like to add to that, Luke? No, I, I think it's, it's just important for, for people to think about it beforehand um, and then be, be ready to commit to um, the next 15. Um, the one thing with that is that if you if you aren't interested in going to the nationals, um, you still do have the opportunity of, of um, competing and winning the states. There's no requirement that the, the winner of the states or the winner of the John Middleton um, uh, trophy will uh, you know has to go to the, to the nationals. But uh, we uh, just want to um, the 
the select the cutoff for us to get our information to um, the Australian Teams Racing Association is pretty short, um, and it ends up being in the middle of school holidays, and so we end up the teams missing out on their selection for the nationals because other teams are humming and ahhing about it. So that's our reasoning um, for uh, uh, doing it that way. Been on the criteria as you mentioned about participating in the two regattas, the two, the state regatta, the, uh, Green. the current state championships. I think the easy one, we just link, we'll just link to the, um, uh, to the selection criteria so that anyone who needs to have a look at that. Cool. In summary, you need to, um, you need to put the application in, you need to pay the $500 um, deposit. If you're not selected, that'll be refunded. Um, if you are selected, then the $500 deposit will go towards doing the open states and the open nationals um, because we think that the committee decided that it's essential that you're doing that um, otherwise it's just really going to be underdone to go to the nationals and it would turn out to be a school excursion rather than um, an actual competitive event for you. Bear in mind that YV was the subsidised is that the yeah. so that $500 is 50 cent of entry fee, YV was subsidised the other 50 cent of those two regattas as well as well as uh, a range of other supports which are all detailed in the criteria. Okay, um, I want to talk about the umpires. So we've got a, um, a mixed team um, of umpires. Uh, every single umpire there is going to be doing their best to do the best decision that they can. Um, we've given them better votes this year, which leads to better decisions because it means that the people can position themselves better to make good decisions. And also, if you're in a good boat all day, it means that you're not as tired and fatigued um, compared to if you're sitting in a 3.4 metre rib, which is tiller steer. It's got a prop guard on it, it's 9.9 .9 horsepower engine, as it tries to chew up all the weeds. And that makes it very hard to umpire, um, and you can't be in the right position. But I just wanted to talk about a concept of, and, and I really want you to share this with your competitors um, and your teams. In terms of the decision making process, there are some incidents which everyone sees and they're going to say it's exploited. Uh, a penalty on the blue boat or a penalty on the yellow boat. Yellow boat. Very obvious ones. Are we match racing out? No. <laughs> blue and yellow. It works for match racing too, but it's between two boats, either the blue boat or the yellow boat, and different teams come together. And everyone knows that there's no penalty, nothing happened, I'm not concerned at all. But one of the variables is the umpires. And depending upon the experience of the umpires, the equipment that they've got, they may not be sure. In which case, they're going to bring flag it as well. As the skills um, of the umpires and the experience and the equipment gets better, then this gets thinner and thinner. And eventually, when you're racing at the very top level, you can actually get a scenario where the difference between blue or yellow is really small. What happens then is if you're sailing and you're yellow, if you sail in such a way that you bring the closeness of the decision right up to the end, so the decisions are all on the line, you've got a much higher chance that it could go either way. If you're doing a protest and it's, it's this much clearance that we're talking about, then it's coming into this scenario here, and what you are doing is that you're putting your result in the hands of the umpires and what they've been able to see. So it could be that you were right by this much or you were wrong by that much and the decision could go either way. So as a risk management strategy, if you're winning and you're in a strong position, you'd be crazy try and force a situation that is this close and then go and protest on it. It's a risk that you don't need to take. Part of the success of the winning team will be the way that they manage the risk out there at the state championships. Knowing when to take risk. Sometimes, 
though, if the yellow's really behind, and they've got nothing to lose, they might take a decision up there. And they're rolling the dice, and it might work out for them. I want everyone to bear this in mind, that on these really close decisions, these close calls, the umpires will do their absolute best. But it is a risky situation for you. Please don't get upset with them. They could be right, they could be wrong. We know that they've done their best. And I mean, that's the, the one thing that I saw um, at the selection trials of the world. The teams that were um, doing really well, when they went in for, when they ma made the call for the umpire, they were 100% you know, sure that they were going to get the call. If it was a dubious decision, they were out and, and, and they were uh, unsure, that they were unsure which way it was going to go. The really good teams didn't make a call. The teams that were, I'd say, uh, further down in the pack, were calling every little situation, yelling for, for umpires, and you know, a, a quarter of the time that it, it was going against them, and, and they're now you know, throwing their hands up and, and getting upset. And the other thing to do is, because occasionally it does go the wrong way, um, that was the other thing the good teams did. If the umpire call went the wrong way, they got on with sailing, you can get back in the race. It's a short race, but it's not the end of the world to do two penalty turns. Maybe if you practice those two penalty turns, you might not be out. Yep, it's definitely one of the skills to be able to do your turns quickly without interfering with other bikes. On that subject, if you do get a question, and if you do have a question about a call and you don't understand why it was a penalty against you or why you didn't get a penalty avoided, what the umpire will do is that they will say, these are the facts. So this is what I saw from here. They will explain that to you. Based on those facts, they will then say, based on that, rules X, Y, Z. They'll probably also then go into the definitions, because so much of this comes down to the, the definitions, which is, um, did you keep clear? Was there room? Was there mark room? And um, did you initially provide room in a seaman like that around the proper course? So the proper course is, is, is the final one. It's all going to come back to the judgment of what they can see in regards to complying with those <coughs> definitions. All, all the rules were like that to them. They'll do that. If you then turn around and say, but that's not what happened, then there's not much that the umpire can help you with. They can perhaps say, well, if that was the case, then the call would have been this. But the umpire's going to explain to you what he saw, or she saw, what the rules are, the definitions, and why that was the result. Please don't get into an argument that that's not what happened. You can, in the debrief, you can come and have a chat to us and you can say, the scenario was this, instead of what you saw, what would the call be, that's fine, they can do that. But they're not there to have an argument about whether they saw something in a particular way or not. So, and, and the more that their, their questions about learning rules and getting better understanding, um, you know, to master them, you probably get a tactic thrown in, which is, if you've done this earlier, then this is how it would be different. But if you're yelling at them that um, that's not what happened, it doesn't get you very far. But, I mean, the umpires are there also doing a job, they've got another race to get to, so if you start arguing about the facts, arguing uh, what's happening, uh, the umpire's going to cut you off and you know, they've got other races to go, we're not going to hold up the competition to have an argument with you. Um, and, yeah, and there'll be times when what you think happened, um, you know, I've, I've seen quite a few times where someone will be saying that they've got an overlap, got an overlap, and the umpire will be sitting alongside and they will see that you've broken the overlap and you've called them up and you know you thought you'd always had an overlap and you actually didn't. So, and I, I, you know, even in, even in cases, you, know, you can't always have a, a perfect judgment where the umpires might be in a much better position, especially alongside like that. Cool. The other things that affect the thickness of the North Shore area, uh, the number of umpires in the boat, will probably only have one up, the luxury of uh, one umpire per boat, and also the number of umpires per race. So, um, you know, the top level, fully resourced, is uh, three uh, umpire boats with two umpires each. We're not going to have that, so we're going to have a thicker, not short, than would be the case if that happens. That's the fact of life. Um, just a show of hands here, 
in terms of us getting all of those resources, flying some IUs from Europe, uh, getting all, uh, if you could get two times as many weeks, and we've already got the just seven times, I'll go for one of your chances. What about the school? Would you, would you value that level of certainty for the cost? That might be hard to get through the budget. Okay. However, having said that, we'll be, we'll be looking through our finals and we'll be doing the best that we can so that we've got, we'll have a higher coverage for those finals. So, the umpires, a lot of the umpires aren't affiliated with any of the schools involved. Yeah, so there's conflicts of interest um, issues and that's a good one, but I'll talk about what the conflict of interest means and also what it means in the context of our competition. So, school sport is a regular occurrence to have teachers and coaches who do umpiring or part of the umpiring. So that's accepted. The Australian Sports Commission talks about it on their website when you do the coaches training course. Um, it's a fact of life. It's the only way that we can manage to do the sport. Parents, Personally, or parents, or parents, it, it happens. You know, for the offside and all that sort of stuff, they do not have the ability in soccer to have four referees. So that's what they do. So just in terms of our management procedure, that. Um, in the seconds, we're much less concerned about it than in the first. So in the first, we're trying to get it quite clear. The umpiring is also a lot simpler in the seconds. Um, you can see the incidents coming, um, and we've got to spread the workload. Over three days of umpiring is pretty, pretty, pretty strange. So we're spreading the workload, and on the Thursday for the seconds, we'll have a mixture of um, coaches, teachers, and people that are um, interested parties. So we've done it before, it's worked really well this season. Um, and we'd also like to get some of the first sailing captains to come and help umpire on Thursday if they can get out. Um, that might be umpiring two captains together, or we're not sure, but as many as you can, we'll help them, and we'd like to do that. When it then gets into um, the gold, um, and the silver, obviously we're going to start to get some splits. Personally, um, my conflict of interest is that my son coaches the second team. So the fact, if I'm doing the first, I don't have under the ISAP definition a conflict of interest. That said, my son's school, I'll always try and avoid umpiring his school because I don't like doing it. I hate it. I'm over it. Yeah, you can it. That got a really raw deal from me and he doesn't want me up far. It's the same with It's often the other way around, isn't it? You, you punish them more to make sure. <laughs> yeah. And the ASC says, if they say don't do that, then it's just so hard not to. And when you're looking at certainty that a penalty should be awarded against your son's opposing team, you're not supposed to be any more certain but it just happens and you absolutely hate it. So it's, it's finally got that umpiring is over match, it's the other school's good luck. <laughs> I can't do it any other way. Um, same for, I'll be doing some stuff in the jury, but if it's, uh, you know, it's in golf fleet or whichever fleet that they're not in, or, you know, I don't have an issue, but the conflict of interest that my son is coaching a second stage, it's not a big problem at first. That said, I'll still try and avoid Xavier um, in any of the first matches because I don't like doing it. You know, I just prefer it. Um, same as Tim Dorning uh, for St. Michael's. He's the same. Tim Bowling as well. Yeah, Tim, Tim Bowling. He's, he's got a daughter. So we swap around. Sometimes we get it wrong. And if we've got a choice between no umpires or you know, a highly experienced umpire, so we're talking about you know, Tim and I are both national race officials. Um, you know, we don't want to put our name out there for the school. Um, damage. Okay, damage. Um, it's going to be mandatory reporting of damage. We're going to really going to keep a close eye on this. Um, the amount of damage deposits that is collected stays the same throughout the event. It's whatever it costs to fix comes out of the damage deposits. We don't want to be deducting it from schools that haven't done damage. So. Our damage reporting procedures are to assign the responsibility appropriately because if you've gone through and you've made contact with no votes at all, it's a real shame that you're getting uh, 
know, a couple of hundred bucks. And there, your last opportunity would be a changeover. Okay. If you haven't reported a changeover, then there are penalties in the sale instructions, which will be automatically applied. Whether it was your fault or not, okay, whether so it was about who did it, yeah, or if there was any damage, yeah. if you don't report it, that's the okay. no handling rule, you can't tell. What about like a till breaks? It happens. Well, that's that's fine. So if you report it, though, you've got to report it because it's yeah. damaged to the yeah. boat. And then they assess it. If it's a universal drive that comes off, I can't imagine that uh, anyone's going to be charged for that. It's just, you know, it's a wear and tear type thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just. We're, we're, so we're especially worried about contact between two boats. Um, like, what was the final figure for the damage on all these boats? Do we know? Oh, or is that the. We had damage on that and the boats <laughs> here. Uh, it's probably going to be up close to a thousand dollars. So for, for that was half half of uh, a morning's sailing we ended up with nearly a thousand dollars worth of damage. We just can't sustain. Um, <coughs> people here have got to explain to committees that well, why they, they all the boats are damaged and they can't sail and things like that. So no, were they own up to it or they 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 don't do it or just no. turned up and then there was no one owned up to it. No one oh. there and never we had boats up. Where you found the damage, you take photos, you get it quoted, and every school in that particular round will get charged with the same job that then. So, 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 so then, what's the penalty for not reporting damage? So, otherwise, see two boats collide, and one of the teams reports the damage and the other doesn't. So what's the I'll need to check the sailing instructions and see the, um, see the points for a race team. So, you can go out, we have contact, you're in the right, no damage was done, didn't report it. Automatically, you lose the race. So it's finished, but we need to know that pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that the um, the procedure will be that the uh, the umpires with another umpire that's not in the match will be able to do that as a scoring change. So they'll work it out and just tell you in the race speed. You just add on, change the score, and that's it. We'll go out all the race. Okay. And we'll have that a little sheet for you that. So you can sort of where the damage was. Oh, that's the finish mate. Oh, the finish mate. Yeah, there's the people. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, talking, I'm talking to the, the race, the race committee. Cool. Yeah. Results, results are going to be coming out on Facebook and Twitter. And you'll be able to view those on our website. And they'll be on the website. It's the responsibility of the competitors to check their results. If you see a flag go off on a finish boat, that doesn't mean anything. It's an indication. The official result is when you're scored here. And, and you'll also be able to see the results on the TV in the changeovers. Yep. The place involved, those results are all being pulled from the same spots. So, um, you know, just make sure you check the results, um, whichever way you need to do it. And the other thing is, when there, if there's a problem with the result, don't go, oh, no, it'll be right, and then realise you've missed out on the spot in the finals, and then complain about the <coughs> results on Thursday. We really need to know about the, any error in the results. It's much easier to fix half an hour after a race or 20 minutes after a race than it is to fix it two days after a race because no one remembers it anymore. And, you know, it's a he said, she said. So the requirement is you must go and check your results. If you want to request redress, it can be the scoring inquiry. And you must do it at the first reasonable opportunity when you come short. So you've got to do that. Otherwise, if it goes longer than say five minutes, you haven't done anything about it, then you will lose the opportunity to get your result corrected. And so, who, who are you reporting to on the PA? Yeah, is there someone in there? So the changeover, the changeover person on oh, the radio, yeah. and, and they will pass that on. It doesn't need to be in writing that one, so we can deal with that request mm -hmm. straight away. But it needs to be immediate. Decision. See it. Do it straight away. Yep. So in other words, what the same is, as coaches or managers, as team captains or whatever, you should be going and checking your Facebook or Twitter or after races to make sure that everything's correct um, straight away. But if that screen goes down and people don't have their own smartphones, there will be a computer in here. The requirement will be that somebody comes ashore. Mm -hmm. Comes and checks the community here. They don't come in at that first reasonable opportunity, they've lost their opportunity. No one will consciously make a mistake on the race being run. But if you haven't checked it, because your result is not posted on, posted on Facebook, if you haven't checked it, you lose. And you've got to do that.
Um, there are the main things that I want to do. The sun instructions will be coming out a couple of days beforehand. On the Saturday, um, assuming everything went fine for the D2 on the Thursday, yep. what if it didn't go fine for the D2 on Thursday, no win? You commence their comp on the Saturday and and I'll have one course and the dip one No, we won't be doing two courses. We're not doing two courses. We'll, so what will happen is as I said here, right yeah. we will change the format to try and get results. We're not right. if dip two hasn't done anything and dip one has gone through a quarter of their stuff, mm. we probably won't have um, that won't be counted as a selection series because if it's that unpredictable to the firsts, mm. then we'll be doing that. We won't be saying, oh, we've got to get the selections done for the Div 1, and all the all the Div 2 people can come, stand around for three quarters of a day, and might get you a race. We're not going to do that. Right. We're all playing the same. You know, and, exactly. And we're a school, we're, we're new at this, yep. and we really want to learn, yep. and the kids have to get experience to learn. Yep. Same, all the Div 2 kids are. They want to be in Div 1. So, yeah. Yep. And that's why we split it into the two days. So on those two days we get it's very clear what our focus is. And then on the final day, we're making sure that everyone's getting equal access and opportunities. If if it made the difference to do two more races for the first to finish off the selection series, I guarantee you we're going to do that. Sure. But we're not going to go yeah. three quarters of a day versus a quarter of a day. Yeah. So and, and we've got four sets of boats and you know the competition divided up. So all of Kids probably should see at, at least half a bit more racing than they saw last year. Yeah, well, but it's yeah. 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 yeah, So the weather could throw this off in disarray. We'll do the best that we can. That's what the race committee does. Um, are there any questions? Uh, first thing. Are supposed to bring their own first aid yeah. pieces? That's on our website, so yeah, that's right, right. which is part of our policy. So we haven't gone up and got multiple first aid kits yeah, yeah. because each school needs each school. Yeah. Luke and I, uh, for all the events, Luke and I have um, very simple first aid kits, which are bandages and band-aids. There's nothing else we're going to do out there. We're not going to, um, if it's, well, it's, cool. if it's an eye wash, we just dunk the head in the water, if it's salt water. <laughs> uh, no point in yeah. us carrying the same like solution. Um, we're not sewing up people with needles or safety things. We've got bandages to stop oh, leaving. So we've got bandages to stop leaving. 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 We've got b
or, or hypothetically or in the other direction, we'll just make that call. So they don't look like they've got their act together. We'll make a call, give them to the teacher, um, and the teacher can tell can clear them to go out again. And we can fix it up with redress, but if we leave them out there, we can't fix up anything else that develops from an injury with redress. Just quickly on a couple of housekeeping matters from the club. Um, we do have the Ironman series happening uh, on the weekend, so their major day is actually Sunday, so we miss that. But they do have some events happening on Saturday, so parking is likely to be a bit of an issue. We're hoping to get some permits from the City of Port Phillip to be able to park buses, maybe a little bit of a distance away, so we're just figuring out how that's going to work, but just to be aware that there will be some issues with that, uh, particularly on the Saturday, the other two days should be alright, yeah. Yes, you can't, um, the council advises that you can't park anything over in this area um, near uh, the end of here, so a lot of the time, I think last year we had TMT buses parked there, I don't think they're going to be very happy about that this year, because they've got probably going to be school, there are tents and stuff. Tents are fine. Um, we've actually applied for a permit for all of that, and we're very confident that's going to be okay because we've spoken to them directly. So, team tents on the wall is fine, but buses parked so in that area. Yeah, drop off, eh? We'll yeah, yeah, drop off's absolutely fine. It should be fine. Um, we're just thinking we we'll at least be able to get in this end. Most of the Ironman action is going to be at the far end of the Tiny Garden, from the north, so it should be no problems. Um, in terms of pedestrian access, they're going to have manned crossings at this gate and also at the pier, so we should have no dramas with that bit. Yes, they need to be weighted tents, so the central we can't pick tents into the grass because we might blow up the irrigation system, so that would be amusing. Um, you know, we've found them in the tent, but uh, yeah, so if you need to bring some ways to those, I think most of the tents these days are, are weighted, hopefully. So, so something to keep in mind, yeah. Um, and we will be operating a, a kiosk from uh, inside this junior lounge where you are right now, so there will be food here available throughout the day, but don't um, be any for rest of the Housekeeping wise. Best coffee is nearby. Best coffee is nearby. We will have coffee on upstairs. Um, beach home is over the road, it's pretty good as well, so you can get stuff. That's And for the parents viewing, yeah. there'll be the bar will be up. Absolutely, so the bar on the balcony upstairs will be all open for people to, to view if that's no problem. Can we get the schools to bring your banners? Like, yeah. Up all around yeah, the on the school, yeah, no problem at all. Yeah. Yeah, on the fence, on the things, let's really get your schools promoted out here, whatever you've got, let's, let's really create a real... Uh, Take it place. Yeah. And what time will the last race be on each of the days? Uh, it's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> last year. Exactly. Yes. 3.17. Uh, what is the latest? Yeah, I don't know if we've set anything other than the last day. Four p.m. Four PM. Four PM. Four PM. There you go. So people want to ask. Four PM. Um, well, that's not good. I had read it before. So um, we'll, we'll try very, very, very hard to be done with the reasonable time at four PM. So um, we're hoping not to keep it here till really, really late because that would be terrible. And everyone needs to go home and have a rest because it's a long three days. And we'll change that on. Sorry. Go on. Yeah. We'll change that on Facebook. Um, we don't want it. Well, everyone here will have had enough from. Day until four o'clock, it's only going to be if weather comes into play. Um, and, and we think that by going later, it's going to give us value in terms of completing this. We won't just go and complete, we won't extend just to complete the whole thing. But if we're at risk of getting bad results or it's still going to be looked risky on the, on the Saturday, then we'll change things around. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's locked. Or even here. Yeah. I think it'll be pretty safe. Yeah. 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 You don't have to, but it's You can make it You can have a few business. It will be very, very safe. Yes, you might. might have some Just a final suggestion to everyone. Please have a read of um, Appendix 2, which are the team racing rules. I recommend you read them all the way through. There are only three pages. Because they're the ones that we'll be using. Question. We've got the blue, actually. Mm -hmm. If it's going to be congested, if we, if we come by pace, is there any way we can store base in the marina or something? Yeah, absolutely. And just if you just let me know the day before, I can find your spot. Yeah, yeah no problem at all. So the question, 
the question there, yeah. if people didn't hear it, was um, if there's congestion, can we come by boat and store our boat here in the marina? And the answer is a definite yes. Absolutely. No problem at all. And you can start <coughs> uh, Yes, you can. Wow. By prior arrangement. But if you're, by coming, prior if you're coming by rib, you might not want to do that. <laughs> yeah, you might need to get home. Yes. <coughs> okay, terrific. I don't have anything else. Are there any more questions? Has anyone not asked a question? <laughs> Still <Yeah>. waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Look forward to a great series. Thanks for coming. Thank you.